So if you'll take your Bibles and go with me to Revelation chapter 17, we will um, look at Revelation 17 tonight and then take a little break for Christmas because nothing says Merry Christmas like the end of the world. <laughs> and so, <laughs> so we, <laughs> so we want to get you in the right frame of mind and, uh, and <laughs> be able to celebrate the birth of Jesus. So we'll take a little break and we'll pick up Revelation at the first of the year if we're, if we're all still here. But for tonight, chapter 17. Let me go to the back wall and uh, look at our timeline again and orient ourselves, especially for those of you who might be new to our study through the book of Revelation. This is a timeline throughout the whole book. And for the last many weeks, we've been in the seven-year tribulation uh, uh, chapters, which are chapters 6 through 18. It's the largest chunk of the book of Revelation. It's where God predicts these cataclysmic events that will come upon the earth by His hand. He will allow these things as a, a final attempt to reach people who have up to that point forsaken him or rejected him so that they might be saved. Um, the good news is some will respond and come to faith in Christ through the tribulation period and others will not. Others will blaspheme God. They will be angry at God. And you know, that's the case for us in general. Uh, adversity tends to either drive us to God or we run from God. And so the tribulation is coming upon the earth and uh, we read through these different series of how God's wrath will be poured out uh, through chapters six through 18, seven seals are broken, seven trumpets are blown, seven bowls that are poured out. And so we finished chapter 16 last week, we got through all of these various series of tribulation um, announcements and, um, and now we head into chapter 17 tonight. And we're going to only look at chapter 17, but I need to link chapter 17 and 18 together because it deals with a very important topic, and that has to do with Babylon. And so what we're going to be looking at tonight is chapter 17, which is a picture of spiritual Babylon. It's, it's when the world will move towards a one world religion. So chapter 17 is really about spiritual Babylon, world, a world religious system. Chapter 18 is about commercial Babylon. It's a political economic uh, system that also is headquartered in Babylon. And so we're going to read a little bit from chapter 7. We're, we're going to go through all of chapter 17, but just before we pray, I'm going to read a little bit from chapter 17. And I'm also going to read a little bit from chapter 18, even though we won't get to chapter 18 tonight, just again to see these two chapters uh, as really a, a, a total topic. So from chapter 17, let me read the first six verses. It says, Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with me, this is John writing, saying to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. And so he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, which was full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet, and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. And on her forehead a name was written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I marveled with great amazement." Now jump over to chapter 18. I just want to read the first three verses so we can kind of see how these chapters are tied together. Verse 1 says, After these things I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was illuminated with his glory. 
And he cried mightily with a loud voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become a dwelling place of demons, a prison for every foul spirit, and a cage for every unclean and hated bird. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of her luxury. All right, let's pray first. Fathers, we come into your presence this evening. We're glad that you invite us to come, Lord. And so we approach the gra- your throne of grace uh, with thanksgiving tonight, Lord, just because you are worthy of our praise. If you didn't do another thing for us, you've already done more than we deserve. And so we love you, Lord, and we thank you that you died for our sins on a cross, that you made the way for us to be saved. And when we look at these chapters and when our hearts tend to grow heavy with all these these uh, terrible things that are coming upon the earth. We pray, Lord, that it would motivate us to be ready personally for your return and also motivate us to love others enough that we would want to share with them the good news of the gospel, that they could be spared these things that are coming. And so we, we want to be ready, Lord. We want you to find us faithful. And so we thank you for your word tonight. Bless it as we study it together in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Chapters 17 and 18 really need to be understood together because they both deal with two distinct systems that are headquartered in the same location. Now, there's a lot of discussion and debate about whether or not Babylon, mentioned in chapter 17 and 18, is literal in terms of a city or whether it is figurative in terms of, you know, it just paints a picture of something. And um, I will tell you that I believe it is literal. It is referring to the literal ancient city of Babylon. I'm going to explain to you why I believe that the Bible teaches it will be revived, rebuilt, and again destroyed. Uh, But Babylon is no stranger to Scripture. Uh, Except for Jerusalem, Babylon is mentioned more times in the Bible than any other city. Did you know that? More than... Uh, 300 references throughout the Bible from Genesis to Revelation refer to the ancient city of Babylon. In the book of Revelation alone, in the whole book of Revelation, when you count them all up, there are 404 verses. And of those 404 verses, 42 verses refer to Babylon. Now, not necessarily by the name Babylon, but like chapter 17 and 18. These are all about Babylon. So all these verses go together to comprise 42 out of 404 verses are about Babylon in the book of Revelation. So basically one out of every 10 verses in the book of Revelation is about Babylon. God has a lot to say about Babylon. Now, Babylon is located about 55 miles south of Baghdad along the Euphrates River in Iraq. And in its glory days under King Nebuchadnezzar, that same king mentioned in the book of Daniel, in its glory days, Babylon was considered one of the seven wonders of the ancient world with the hanging gardens of Babylon. It was a beautiful city that Nebuchadnezzar himself had built to its, uh, to, uh, during the time of its height in terms of its power, strength, and um, the Babylonian Empire. And so the Hanging Gardens of Babylon mark one of the uh, seven wonders of the ancient world. The city of Babylon was considered impenetrable. Uh, It was built with walls that the Greek historian Herodotus, the walls were still there that Herodotus could write and record. 35 stories high were the walls around Babylon. 87 feet thick were the walls. And so they believed, the Babylonians believed, that Babylon, the capital city of the Babylonian Empire, was impenetrable. But the Bible predicted that it would fall. In the book of Jeremiah, in chapter 51, 60 years before it fell, God prophesied through Jeremiah that Babylon would fall. In the book of Isaiah, between chapters 45 and 47, 150 years before it fell, Isaiah 
would not only say how it would fall, but he even named the Persian king Cyrus by name in the book of Isaiah 150 years before Cyrus was born. That's how God is prophetic in all things, because he knows all things. So 150 years before Cyrus, the king of Persia, was born, Isaiah prophesied by his name that he would be the king to take the ancient city of Babylon. And so it was. And Babylon was conquered in a unique strategic military uh, maneuver. The Euphrates River, uh, which is where Babylon was built, the Euphrates River was intentionally diverted around the city of Babylon to form a wet moat as an extra layer of defense. So not only do you have walls that are 35 stories high and 87 feet thick, but you have a wet moat going all the way around the city of Babylon. And because the Euphrates served to be a source of fresh water for Babylon, it was also diverted under the city walls and would meander throughout the city and provide not only a beautiful landscape, but also a, a fresh water supply for the people living there. So what King Cyrus did was, he just simply dammed up the Euphrates. And when he dammed up the Euphrates a few miles north of the city, then when the Euphrates dried up, he took the Persians and he went under the city wall on the dry riverbed of the Euphrates and took Babylon without even firing a shot. Not that they had guns back in the day, but you get my point. And so Babylon fell on October the 12th, 539 BC. October the 12th, 539 BC. But as the Bible predicted its fall, the Bible also predicts that it will be rebuilt. Now, those of you who are old enough to remember, Saddam Hussein tried to do it. In fact, Saddam Hussein, the leader of Iraq, also had a coin minted during the time that he was leader in Iraq with Nebuchadnezzar's image on one side of the coin and his image on the other side of the coin. Because he understood historically that Nebuchadnezzar had taken Babylon there in Iraq to its pinnacle of success. And Saddam had a vision of trying to take it back to the days of Nebuchadnezzar. And so Saddam Hussein built his palace on the old foundation of Nebuchadnezzar's palace. He spent $500 million building his palace there that he didn't get to occupy. And he was in the process of restoring Babylon to its former glory when he tried to annex Kuwait. Many of you remember when this happened back in 1990. And uh, when he did that, uh, sanctions were imposed upon him, a war ensued, and ultimately he was deposed, captured, tried, and hanged. And so he tried to do it but it still has not been rebuilt. But the Bible tells us that it will be rebuilt. And not only will it be rebuilt, but the book of Revelation also says that it will be destroyed by the Lord when he returns. So Babylon will again be a literal location. Right now it's just ancient ruins, but it will be a literal location that represents two systems, the two systems on the screens that there will be a spiritual Babylon where it will be the headquarters of a one world religion that emerges from this ancient city. And it will also serve to be the headquarters for a commercial Babylon being a world economic system, a one world government, a one world economy. So when we get here to chapter 17, I need to frame the background and we need to understand more background too to appreciate this chapter. Chapter 17 probably occurs during the first half of the tribulation period. So when we talk about the tribulation period, we're talking about seven years of just terror that has rained out upon the earth. In the first three and a half years is likely when chapter 17 takes place. And if you'll notice with me in the verses that we, that we just read, there is this reference to a woman. Uh, she's not a literal woman, she's a picture. And she is referred to as a harlot in the New King James, from what I'm reading, but uh, that word harlot is translated prostitute in the NIV and the ESV. And she's called a harlot or a prostitute three times in this chapter, in verse 1, in verse 15, and in verse 16. And her title is right there uh, indented in your Bibles in verse 5. Uh, she is mystery, Babylon the great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. 
So who or what does she really represent? So in summary, for you note takers, this is who the woman really represents. The woman of Revelation 17 represents a false world religion that rises on the back of the Antichrist and seduces the nations. Now, in order to understand how that comes to be, we need to understand the historical um, context of Babylon. So I want you for a moment to just uh, put something handy there in Revelation 17, we'll come back to it. But flip to the very beginning of your Bibles in Genesis chapter 10. In Genesis chapter 10, we get the background of Babylon and it's important to understand this in order to understand you know, what's going to happen in the future. So history sometimes can help us understand the future. And in this case, in Genesis chapter 10, we are introduced to somebody along the list of the uh, uh, nations that descended from Noah. We come to his great grandson, whose name is Nimrod. And he is mentioned here in Genesis chapter 10. And I'm gonna read uh, just verses eight through 10. In Genesis 10 verse eight, it says, Cush, begot Nimrod, and he began to be a mighty one on the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. There it is said, therefore it is said, like Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord, and the beginning of his kingdom was Babel. Now notice that. Babel is the ancient word for Babylon. The beginning of his kingdom was Babel, Erek, Akkad, and Kalne in the land of Shinar. Shinar is uh, the, the ancient term for uh, 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 Mesopotamia or Babylonia. From that land, he went to Assyria and built Nineveh, Rehoboth, Ir, Kala, and Rezin between Nineveh and Kala, that is the principal city. So what we're introduced to here is the beginning days of the ancient city of Babylon, which was previously known just simply as Babel. And the one who built Babel was Nimrod. Now Nimrod, again, is the great-grandson of Noah. And the Bible here seems to present him to be a really, you know, nice guy, you know, man's man, hunter before the Lord, mighty one on the earth. But don't be misled. The terminology is not referring to a great guy. The terminology is referring to somebody who, well, even in his name, his name Nimrod is really from, it's a Semitic word from the Akkadian language. Its roots are in Hebrew, but his name means rebellious one. Nimrod translates to rebel or rebellion or the rebellious one. And that was his attitude. This guy was not a mighty hunter because he was to be appreciated and esteemed. This guy was a mighty hunter because he was a rebel. And he was in particular a rebel against God. Because when it says there in the passage in verse 9 that he was a mighty hunter before the Lord, the word before in Hebrew is panim. Panim means face. And so it literally translates, he was in the face of God. He got in God's face. He was in opposition to God. So not a good guy. Nimrod, not a good guy. And one of the cities that he built among several, as he started to kind of take over the earth and lead these, you know, um, building projects in different places, they're primarily in what is today modern Iraq, uh, is Babel. He built that as one of the capital cities. Now, Babel is probably better known to us in chapter 11 of Genesis. If you'll jump over to chapter 11, the Tower of Babel. There's an incident that happens in the Tower of Babel. And so in, in Genesis chapter 11, let me read the first nine verses. Now the whole earth had one language and one speech, and it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And then they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. And they had a brick for stone, and they had asphalt for mortar. And they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Note that. Let us make a name for ourselves. Notice this. They don't want to make a name for God. They want to make a name for themselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, indeed, the people are one. 
and they all have one language, and this is what they begin to do. Now, nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. Come, let us go down, and there confuse their language. By the way, the pronoun us, it's a, it's a reference to the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, one God revealed in three persons. He says, come, let us go down, and there confuse their language that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth, and they ceased building the city. Therefore, its name is called Babel. Because there the Lord confused, that's what it means, confusion, confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of the earth. So, your attention, the, the, the people at this particular time had one language. It had not yet been diverse. They had not been yet scattered. And in their unity, they used their unity in opposition to God. They decided, let's collectively get together. We're going to decide what's best. We're going to decide what we want to worship, who we want to worship, and nobody can tell us otherwise. And they built this tower, which was actually a ziggurat. Now, a ziggurat was basically this pyramid-shaped structure that had a staircase usually that wound to the top, and it would have a deck at the top. It would have an overlook at the top. Again, the Greek historian Herodotus recorded seeing one that measured 700 feet high. The Washington Monument is only 555 feet high. So imagine something immense reaching to the heavens. Why did they want to reach to the heavens? Because they wanted to worship the starry hosts. They wanted to worship the sun and the moon and the stars, not God. They wanted to make a name for themselves, and they started worshiping astrology. You can trace all occult worship and astrological worship to Babel or Babylon. This is where it started. The occult started in Babel, in Babylon. And so God then decides, I'm going to confuse the language. I'm going to scatter them, lest they get together here. And they decide that they're going to have a unified rebellion against me. And so the language then began to, to be diversified there in Babel, Babylon. And, and then the people were scattered, and they began to live together and group together based on the languages that they could understand. But the beginning of astrology and occult practices happened here. The worship of the constellation, the zodiac, all started here. It's the oldest record of astrology that comes from this region. <clears throat> and the Bible is basically a story in some ways. I mean, obviously, the central story of the Bible is Jesus and the gospel and dying for our sins on the cross. But in, in some ways, when you think about the two cities that I, may, that I mentioned are, are named more than any other cities in the Bible, it's Jerusalem first and then Babylon. This is a book about the tale of two cities, where you have Jerusalem as the city of peace and you have Babylon as the city of confusion. And, and that's the way it is. And that's the way it's going to be. And thus, now, when you go back to the book of Revelation, you can understand a little bit about the historical background of Babel because the same kind of thing is going to take root again in Babylon that happened uh, here um, in ancient times. Now, in addition to, because this plays into chapter 17 of Revelation, in addition to the people of Babel or Babylon worshiping the sun, the moon, the stars, the zodiac, and all of this, there was an, an ancient legend that also emerged in Babel. And the ancient legend went something like this, that Nimrod, the guy who built Babel, settled Babel, married a woman whose name was Sumeramis. And Sumeramis uh, in the Bible is uh, noted as the uh, queen of heaven, um, in the book of uh, Jeremiah, ten times in the book of Jeremiah, he mentions the queen of heaven. It is a reference to Sumeramis, the wife of Nimrod. And they had a son. And they had a son named Tammuz. Tammuz is mentioned once in the Bible in Ezekiel chapter 8, verse 14. Now, the legend part is that Tammuz was conceived in a miraculous way. He wasn't. And another legend was that Tammuz was gored by a, um, a boar and, and rose from the dead. Those things became um, these mythological legends. But Nimrod uh, marries Sumeramis. They have a son named Tammuz. And that legend took root. And in Babel, they started worshiping the mother-son combination of Sumeramis and Tammuz. And that legend carried on through various civilizations. 
The Assyrians had their version. They worshipped Ishtar and Tammuz. The Canaanites worshipped Ashtoreth and Baal. The Egyptians worshipped Isis and Horus. The Greeks worshipped Aphrodites and Eros. The Romans worshipped Venus and Cupid. These are all mother-son combinations that started in Babel, in Babylon. And you know what's interesting? Tammuz, the name of this uh, son born to Nimrod and Sumeramus, Iraq named, back in the early 80s, Iraq named its nuclear reactor Tammuz. And in 1981, there was a secret military operation that was launched by the Israelis under the command of then Prime Minister Menachem Begin, who uh, dispatched F-15s and F-16s over to Iraq. They flew at low altitudes across Jordanian airspace and across Syrian airspace and into Iraq, and they took out Iraq's nuclear reactor. They killed Tammuz. And it was like, uh, and, and they, they approached undetected because they flew at such low altitude that they, that they went in undetected and uh, took out Tammuz, Iraq's nuclear reactor, June the 7th, 1981. So it's no wonder, given the history of this city, that it will rise from the ashes to once again become the platform for false religion in the end times. This is why I've shared all this with you. It, it, was, it was the birthplace of false religion. It will also be the death place of false religion. But Babylon will rise again from the ashes. I'm not telling you this. The Bible is telling you this. Right now, it's kind of a hard thing to imagine, but it will happen. Bear in mind, when the church is raptured, and again, if you've been here through our study of Revelation, I believe that the church is raptured before the tribulation begins. Good people can debate that. But when the church is raptured, there's going to be the absence of the Christian presence, right? Now, people can still get saved, but the number of people getting saved is going to be minuscule compared to the number of Christians presently on the earth who will be taken, raptured, before the tribulation. So, there will no longer be the presence of Christianity, at least not in strong numbers, during the tribulation period. That's going to be absent now. What you're going to have left is a vacuum. What fills that vacuum? Well, it's going to be one of two things. It's either going to be an amalgam of other world religions right now, false world religions that kind of get together under what is something we should all be aware of today. It sounds very much like we're not being a team player when I say this, but there is this ecumenical movement that you need to be aware of. Not everybody who says they are of the church are of the church. Not everybody who says they are of Christ are of Christ. And there's this ecumenical movement like, well, don't we all just worship the same God and don't all paths lead to God? No, no, we don't. We don't all worship the same God. And there's only one path to get to God, and it's Jesus. So when Christians are taken and there's this vacuum created without the presence of the, of the real church, you're going to have just left a bunch of world religions that either will combine and form under the umbrella of an ecumenical movement. We're now just one body of believers and, and whatever that looks like, and that becomes the one world religion. Or, in the absence of Christianity, what is the dominant world religion right now? Islam. Christianity barely outnumbers uh, Islam. So when Christianity is taken, the dominant world religion will be Islam. I'm not necessarily saying that Islam becomes that one world religion. I don't, I don't know what, that, what it will actually be, but I will tell you this much, it will be a false world religion that will be led by the false prophet and will ultimately point people to worship not the true and living God, but the Antichrist. So let me take you through some of these verses and, and here in chapter 17. I've highlighted some of them just to make it easier on the screens for us. In verse 1, it talks about this woman. Again, she represents this false world religion. She sits on many waters. Well, we know that means global influence because the best commentary on the Bible is the Bible. And when you look at verse 15 in the same chapter, it says, Then he said to me, The waters which you saw where the harlot sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. So it can't get any more clear than that. 
So when she sits on many waters, it's figurative language. And verse 15 tells us that the figurative language was representing peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. She sits on the sea of humanity, in other words. She, this world religion, this false world religion, has global influence. And then in verse 2, it talks about how the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So that tells us it's a false religion. It's clearly a false religion. And it's spiritual adultery or it's spiritual fornication to uh, have your allegiance and your love and your loyalty to something or someone else other than, than God. In verse 3, in verse 3, it says she is sitting on a scarlet beast. That means that she rode to prominence with the Antichrist because he is the beast. And in verse 4, it says she is arrayed in purple and scarlet, adorned with gold, precious stones, and pearls. And so all of this symbolism tells us that, that this world religion will be associated with wealth and royalty. Now, some people have suggested, and there's books written about this and opinions, that when you, know, when you hear about a wealthy uh, world religion, um, uh, some people say, well, you know, could it be that the Roman Catholic Church, I've heard many people believe, you know, maybe the Pope is the Antichrist and the Roman Catholic Church um, is, is this false religion. You know, there's, there's many different opinions and debates about it. I, I personally think it's bigger than the Roman Catholic Church. I, that's just me, but you know, there are different people who can hold to that opinion. By the way, there are, despite the fact that there are different um, uh, parts of the Roman Catholic Church that are obviously unbiblical, there are some people in the Roman Catholic Church who love Jesus. And when I think about the 19, in the 1970s, the charismatic movement that swept through the Roman Catholic Church, there, there are some brothers and sisters there. I, I'm not one to disparage the, all of the Roman Catholic Church. There's a, there, there, uh, there are some saved and unsaved people who are Methodists. There are some saved and unsaved people who are Baptists. There are some saved and unsaved people who are Lutheran. So, you know, God does His redeeming work in the hearts and lives of people. And um, I, I think that what you see here in Revelation 17 is much bigger than, than what we presently see, but people can debate that. Verse 6 tells us that she was drunk with the blood of the saints. So that means that this world religion is promoted through violence against believers. So now that makes others say, well, then it, it might be Islam and the advancing of, of Islam by the sword. So we don't really know what it is. Um, I don't plan to be here to see it. So... Um, you know, if, if, if you want to hang around to figure it out, uh, God bless you, but I don't plan to be here. All right, let's keep reading. Verse, verse 7. But the angel said to me, why did you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her, which has the seven heads and the ten horns. The beast that you saw was and is not, and will ascend out of the bottomless pit and go to perdition. And those who dwell on the earth will marvel, whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they see the beast that was and is not and yet is. Here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. There are also seven kings. Five have fallen, one is, and the other has not yet come. And when he comes, he must continue a short time. The beast that was and is not, is himself also the eighth, and is of the seven, and is going to perdition. Are you following this? I'll come, I'll circle back, don't worry. The ten horns which you saw are ten kings who have received no kingdom as yet, but they receive authority for one hour as kings with the beast. These are of one mind, and they will give their power and authority to the beast. That's the Antichrist. These will make war with the Lamb, that's Jesus, and the Lamb will overcome them, amen? For he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and those who are with him are called chosen and faithful. And then he said to me, the waters which you saw where the harlot sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. And the ten horns which you saw on the beast, some translations say, and the beast, these will hate the harlot, make her desolate and naked, eat her flesh and burn her with fire. For God has put it into their hearts to fulfill his purpose, to be of one mind and to give their kingdom to the beast, to the Antichrist, until the words of God are fulfilled. And the woman whom you saw is that great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. That's Babylon. So in verses 9 and 10, it tells us here that she sits on seven mountains, which are seven kings or kingdoms 
meaning it's associated with the political system. Because it, it tells us that there in, in verse 9, I'll just read it again. It says, here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are the seven mountains on which the woman sits. There are also seven kings. Now, this is, a, this is an important verse, though. The next verse in verse 10 says, there are also seven kings. Five have fallen. One is, and the other has not yet come. And when he comes, he must continue a short time. So I'm going to break that verse down for us. Here is verse 10. There are also seven kings, five have fallen, past tense, one is present tense, and the other has not yet come, future tense. Now, this is, the tenses are based on where John is at this particular time. This is first century when he's writing these things under the inspiration of the Spirit. So first, let's talk about what are the five that have fallen. What he's talking about are five world-dominating empires. Historically speaking, these are the five world-dominating empires that have come and gone from the vantage point of where John is here. Egypt, Assyria, Babylonia, the Medo-Persian Empire, and, and the Greek Empire. Those five empires have come and gone, even from where John is. And then when he says one is, what was the world empire at the time that John is writing this? The Roman Empire. So one is, is Rome. But then he says, and the other has not yet come. Now, when you look um, further, and it talks about how this other one, when he comes, he must continue a short time. And it says in verse 11, the beast, that is the Antichrist, that was and is not, is himself also the eighth, and is of the seven, and is going to perdition. So, of the seven, five have come, one is, that's the sixth. There's this seventh world-dominating empire that is going to come. And when it tells us there in verse 11 that the Antichrist was of the seventh, and he becomes an eighth, what it means is that there's this confederation of nations that will form the seventh one, not yet ha that has occurred, this is future. The Antichrist will be a part of that, and he will come out of that to be himself a world dictator. And so to summarize, the, the other has not yet come. It represents a 10 nation confederation that includes the Antichrist, it only rules for a short time, that's what the passage says, until they give Antichrist full control. Because if you notice in verse 12, it says the ten horns. So that's the representation of a horn as authority. That's the representation of the ten nation confederation, which you saw are ten kings who have received no kingdom as yet, but they receive authority for one hour, meaning for a very short time, as kings with the beast. So that explains the bullet point that I have there on the screen for us. Because what it's telling us is, since the Roman Empire, there's not been another world-dominating empire. I mean, you know, Hitler tried it. It failed. There's been other people who have attempted it. It has failed. But there will come a day when, and I can't explain it. I can't, you know, figure it out. What, what geographical areas of the globe will be divided into 10 regions, but that's what's going to happen. The globe is going to be divided into 10 regions. You know, when we look at like the European Union and we see how, well, you know, and then there's Brexit, so there are people coming and going. But when you look at how there are geographical areas where countries can come together under common currency or common law or whatever that might be, it's not far-fetched for us to think that there can be 10 geographical regions around the globe, each with their own president, king, ruler, whatever the case might be, because that's the way the world is going to be divided. It is coming. It is going to happen. The Bible says so. And among those ten rulers, one is the Antichrist of whatever particular region. And it tells us here in the passage that the ten don't rule for very long before either the Antichrist persuades them or Satan inspires them, whatever the case might be. They turn over their power to the Antichrist. And they say, you go ahead and you just rule the whole globe. And that will take us into chapter 18, where we talk about one world government with the Antichrist ruling and reigning there. But what it tells us at the end here of chapter 17, just to bring this to, to a close tonight, in verses 16 and 17, is that the beast and ten horns will hate the harlot. 
okay? They're going to they're gonna hate this world religion that has risen up, even though they've allowed it. They're going to hate it. They're going to bring her to ruin, and they're going to give their kingdom to the beast, meaning they're going to overthrow this world religion, and they're going to hand world power over to the Antichrist so that he will rule the world and he will be worshipped by the world. This is what is to come. So if that freaks you out, you better get right with Jesus. That's all I got to say with you right now. That's a fear tactic. I don't care what it takes. You need to get right with Jesus. Get right with Jesus. Let's pause there and pray. And then uh, what is it? Is it three weeks or it's not even for four weeks maybe that we get back together after the first of the year. So let's pray. Lord, as we think about these things that are to come, you tell us these things in advance. And uh, we just pray, Lord, that our hearts would be ready. And uh, Lord, even though I, I say it in, in jest, I, I mean it sincerely that if there's any of us in this place tonight or listening to this podcast later who don't know you, they're not right with you. These things should trouble them. For those of us who know you, despite the fact that the world is going to get crazy and crazier still, we have our peace and our confidence in you. We trust you. We know you're coming again. You're going to take us home. We're going to be with you forever and ever. But if there's anyone who doubts that, who is unsure of where they stand with you, I pray tonight they'd open their heart to you. Thank you, Lord, for using different things to get our attention. And maybe tonight you just want to use this Bible study to get the attention of some that you want to have relationship with. So I'm going to pause in my prayer because if that is you, don't waste another minute of your life. Get right with God. Turn to Him. Surrender your life to Him. Make a decision to trust Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Stop running from God. He's going to continue to pursue you and pursue you and pursue you. And it doesn't get easier for you. Whatever it takes, God is going to reach you. So surrender early. Surrender even tonight. You can pray this prayer with me right where you're seated. You can say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart tonight and save me. Save me from my sins. Forgive me of all the different ways I've sinned against you. I thank you, Jesus, that you died for all of my sins. Cleanse my heart tonight, Lord. Come into my life. I surrender to you as my Lord and Savior. I commit to live my life for your glory tonight. And by faith I receive you. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. If you prayed that prayer tonight, we always love to give out Bibles so you can remember the decision that you made. There will be a pastor down front here to hand you a Bible if you want to receive one before you go home. Otherwise, God bless you, and uh, we'll see you Sunday. God bless you.